Hello, and in today's Red Business session, we're going to look at the A-level astrophysics option topic with a subsection on telescopes. So the first topic we're going to look at is refracting telescopes. Now, there are two main types of telescopes used in astronomy. Optical telescopes, which are telescopes that use visible light to produce images, and non-optical telescopes. Telescopes which use the non-visible parts of the electromagnetic spectrum to produce images. Now, optical telescopes are the telescopes more familiar to the general public, while Whilst the more common telescopes in professional astronomy are non-optical telescopes. So we're going to first cover the physics of optical telescopes before moving on to non-optical telescopes. Now there are two main types of optical telescopes used in astronomy, refracting telescopes and reflecting telescopes. So refracting telescopes produce images when radiation refracts through the glass, whilst reflecting telescopes produce images when radiation is reflected off the glass. So refracting telescopes are expensive, easily distorted and are difficult to manufacture, whilst reflecting telescopes are cheaper, can be supported, and are easy to manufacture. So refracting telescopes produce images which have chromatic aberration, whilst reflecting telescopes produce images which have spherical aberration. So a refracting telescope consists of two converging lenses in normal adjustment, whilst a reflecting telescope consists of two mirrors and a converging lens. Now we call this particular arrangement uh, the Cassie grain arrangement. So let's now first focus on refracting telescopes, which builds on concepts covered in GCSE physics, with the idea that lenses are pieces of glass which refract radiation when it passes through the glass. So telescopes which use converging lenses to produce an image are called refracting telescopes. So to understand how refracting telescopes work, we've got to understand the physics of the lens. So the idea are that mirrors are pieces of glass that reflect light, whilst lenses are pieces of glass that refract light. And we can show how light is refracted with the lens diagram. So in our lens diagram, the emitter of the radiation is placed on the left-hand side and the receiver of the radiation is placed on the right-hand side with the lens in the middle. So to draw accurate lens diagrams, you've got to follow some fundamental rules. The, um, there is an imaginary line that passes through the center of the lens, which you call the optical axis or principal axis. The object is the object which gives off light, whilst the thing we see as humans is the image. Now we draw an image or object in a lens diagram by using an arrow and it's important to note that where the lines cross in a lens diagram is where your image will form. Now this is shown in this particular lens diagram here, or in this particular uh, illustration at this point. Now there are two types of lenses. You've got convex lenses, which bring the rays together at a focus, which they're sometimes known as converging lenses, and concave lenses, which spread the rays out and are sometimes known as diverging lenses. Now it's important that we symbolize those two lenses with the following symbols on our lens diagrams. So a convex lens lens will always bring light together to a focus, whilst a concave lens will always spread the light away from each other. Now you will get refraction both when the radiation hits the front of the lens and hits the outer part, the outside of the lens. However, to simplify this, we will draw only one refraction as if it happened at the central line of our lens. Now if we assume the light hitting the lens has come from very far away, which we can assume to be infinity, so such as the sun or any st other stellar object, we get the following diagram. Now, as as the radiation has travelled a long distance, those, le those rays of radiation have become parallel to each other. So it's important to note that with the convex lens, the lens will make the rays converge to one point, which we call the principal focus or the focal point. Now the perpendicular distance from the centre of the lens to the focal point is what we call the focal length. Now so if we assume the light comes from a very distant source, which is infinity, the point at which all the light converges to the point from the infinity is the principal focus of the focal point, and the perpendicular distance from the centre of the lens to the principal focus is called the focal length. So rays which have travelled a great distance can be assumed to be parallel to each other. So rays from any astronomical object can be considered to be parallel to each other. Now rays which are parallel to the principal axis are called axial rays. This is because the rays are parallel to the actual axis. Now, all axial rays, as shown in the diagram, converge at the principal focus after they pass through the convex lens. Now, the focal plane of a lens is the plane perpendicular to the principal axis that contains the principal focus. So you can also define the focal length of a lens as the perpendicular distance from the center of the lens to the focal plane. Now, it's important to note that we can also have non-axial rays as well as axial rays. So rays which are not parallel to the 
the principal axis are called non-axial rays. So non-axial rays can still be parallel to each other if they've traveled a great distance. Now rays hitting a lens are much more likely to be non-axial compared to axial as only one degree of the orientation gives axial rays and 359 degrees will give non-axial rays. So the non-axial rays will all converge and form an image somewhere on the focal plane. Now you can work out where that position is by looking at the non-axial ray going through the center of the lens because it must be undeflected and therefore it will form a position of your image on the focal plane. So the other non-axial rays will then all converge on that point also as that is where the uh, point the image must be formed at. So for ray diagrams you need to be able to describe images in three different categories. You've got to describe it as either upright which is where the image is the same orientation of the object or inverted where the image is a different orientation to the object. You can describe it as magnified where the image is bigger than the object or diminished where the image is smaller than the object or real where the image can be projected onto a screen or virtual where the images cannot be projected onto a screen. Now magnification can be worked out with the equation image height divided by object height which is an equation given to your examination books you do not need to memorize the equation. Magnification has no units it is just a ratio but a magnification greater than one means the image is bigger than the object whilst a magnification less than one means the object is bigger than the, uh, the image. Now it's important to know that the image height and object height can be any height units as long as they are the same for both the image and the object. Now a real image is formed when rays of radiation from a point in space are made to pass through another point in space. So the light rays are actually there and the image can be captured on the screen. Now a virtual image is formed when the light rays from a point on an object appear to have come from another point in space. So the light rays are not really where the image appears to be so the image cannot be captured on the screen. Now a converging lens can form both real and virtual images to depending on where the object is. If the object is further away than the focal length from the image, the image is real. If the object is closer than the focal length from the lens, the image is virtual. Now you have to be able to draw a ray diagram for a converging lens for, a ver for objects from a variety of different distances away. So the first thing you would do is draw in the lens as a vertical straight line in the center of the paper, and then you draw in the optical axis as a horizontal straight line through the center of the lens. You then draw in the principal focus as F on the optical axis, and it is the same on both sides of the lens and the distance between the center of the lens and the focus is the focal length. So for all lenses it's assumed that the focal length is symmetrical on either side of the lens. Now you then draw in the object given off the light as an arrow. You'll be told where to do this or you'll be given this in an examination. Now again remember that the top of the arrow is the top of the object and the arrow tail is the bottom of the object. The first ray you would draw in is a axial straight line uh, from the top of the object to the lens. Now again what will happen is this will then uh, refract and go through the principal focus of your lens as shown on the particular diagram. This occurs as all par parallel axial rays refract through the focal point of a lens. All axial rays must refract through the focal point of a lens. So this comes from the definition of the focal point. You then draw in second line from the top of the object to the center of the lens and you've got to remember that the, when you draw this, okay, that the um, the line will go through undeflected, keeping it straight. Now, again, what happens is this will occur as the rays traveling through the center of the lens do not refract. So as a result, where the two lines meet is where the image forms. Now, remember, you drew your line from the top of the object, so it must be the top of your image. So you can see here the rays, the ray lines cross here, so the image is then formed. So you can see here that you've got your image. Now, remember that you found here the top of your particular image. Now, it's important important to note that you can then describe what your image is. So what can you say in this point? The image is real, it's inverted and it's magnified. It's real as the lines actually cross, it is inverted as the image and object of different orientations and it's magnified as the image is larger than the object. And if you want to just double check to make sure you are correct, you can draw a straight line from the top of the lens going through the focal point on the left hand side of the lens. You can then draw it going straight line along and at this point if you draw the diagram correct it should also also go through where the other two lines intersect each other. So this is what you've got to do if you want to draw a ray diagram for a convex lens. So you would draw in your uh, situation and then you draw a ray parallel to the axis from the top of the object and refract it through the focal point on the other side. You then draw a ray to the center of the lens from the top and it passes through undeflected and then you know that where the lines cross is where the top of the object forms. So you then get your image at this point. Now we can use our lens diagrams to calculate different measurable quantities of a lens. So we can 
allow us to derive properties of the telescopes which use these lenses. So we can therefore have our object distance, the perpendicular distance from the object of the center of the lens, which is given the symbol U, and you can define the image distance as the perpendicular distance from the center of the lens to the image which is given the symbol V. Now you've got your object distance, you've got your image distance. So we can link these values together with the following equation. 1 over F equals 1 over U plus 1 over V, where F is the focal length, U is the object distance, and V is the image distance. Now the unit of each value must be consistent in your equation, and it's, for example, all our lenses could be given in millimetres, and we call this idea the lens equation, which is an equation given to you in your examination book. Now a converging lens can form both real and virtual images depending on where the object is. So if the object is further away than the focal length on the lens, the image is real and inverted. If the object is closer than the focal length away from the lens, the image is virtual. So if in this equation V is positive, then the image is real, but if V is negative, the image is virtual. So if we look at the following question where an object is placed 3 meters from a converging lens with a focal length of 1.2 meters, at what distance from the lens will the image be produced? Will the image be real or virtual? So if you draw on your diagram, you can work out these particular values. So you'd say 1 over F equals 1 over U plus 1 over V. Pop in all the numbers, work it through, and you get V to equal 2.0 meters. So if the value is positive, the image must be real, because the object is further than the focal length away from the lens, so it has to be real. Now, an astronomical refracting telescope consists of two convergent lenses. So we call these the objective lens and the eyepiece lens. Now the objective lens converts, converges the rays from the object to form a real image. So this will occur as the object is, two, is more than two focal lengths away from the lens. However, the image form will be very small and therefore difficult to observe. So your eyepiece lens magnifies the real image to form a virtual image. This occurs as the object is less than a focal length away from the image, so from the lens. So as a result, you'll only ever be asked to draw an astronomical telescope in normal adjustment. Now, normal adjustment means the two lenses share the same focal plane. Does it mean that they've got the same focal lens? Now, many telescopes are kept in normal adjustment in the real world. However, some telescopes can be kept out of normal adjustment. So in this example, this is our focal plane shared by both lenses because our telescope is in normal adjustment. We can then use this to define the focal length of the lenses. So that's the focal length of the objective lens, and this is the focal length of the eyepiece lens lens. Now we can then use this to work out the total length of a refracting telescope because the total length of a refracting telescope is the sum of the two of the two um, focal lengths FO plus FE. So therefore we can use this particular diagram to show what happens when radiation hits an astronomical refracting telescope in normal adjustment. So the first step to do is draw a straight non-axial ray that passes through the center of the objective lens. It will therefore go straight through undeflected and hit the focal plane and that is where the image will, will be found. You will then draw two more non-axial rays. Now, you, most exam questions tend to ask for three non-axial rays. At this point, they will then uh, converge towards the uh, focal plane and form an image where that undeflected ray was. So this is going to form a diminished real image at this point. You will, there draw in, you will then draw in a construction line, a dotted line that passes through the points where the rays cross on the focal plane and the center of the eyepiece lens. Now, a construction line is an imaginary line used to help construct images, which is denoted with a dashed line. So what we then do is we continue the path of our original non-axial rays until they encounter the center of the eyepiece lens. They will then, um, on ray diagrams, it's easy to draw the eyepiece lens lower than the objective lens because of this. Then when they hit the center of the lens, we refract the non-axial rays through the eyepiece lens to have the lenses parallel to the construction line. So a virtual image is formed at infinity, which we can show by extending these lines backwards with dashed lines. So our detector is placed here. So the detector refracts the parallel lines into an image to be observed. So this will lead to a this will lead to our astronomical telescope uh, producing the images we can observe. Now we can look at magnified images through our astronomical refracting telescope. Now a magnified image is an image larger than the object. So you can see our object here and our image. Now we can measure this change with the quantity of magnification. Now as many objects are not straight line images, it's easy to measure a quantity called angular magnification. The angular magnification is the change in the angle subtended by the image compared to the angle subtended by the object. So here's our angle subtended by our image, which would give this the symbol theta i. Here's our angle subtended by our object, theta 
O. Now the change of magnification is comparing these two, theta I and theta O. So the angular magnification is the angle subtended by the image divided by the angle subtended by the object, theta I divided by theta O. Now this equation is given to you in your examination book, so you're just going to be able to use this equation, not memorize it, and it doesn't matter what units are used in the angles for the formula as long as the units are consistent throughout the equation. Now angular magnification has no units, it is a ratio showing change. So the angle subtended by the object can be used to determine either the diameter of the object, S, or the distance between the object and the telescope, R. So we can use it with the equation S equals R theta, which comes from a mathematical equation, which you should know in the definition of the radian. Now, it's important to note that when the angle subtended is very small, which it will be in this case, the S value becomes a straight edge and it becomes a situation like a triangle. Now, this for this concept to be used, we must use radians for our angle to be subtended by the object. Now, it's a very common examination question to work out the diameter of an astronomical object or the distance between the objects from the angle subtended. Now, we can also use the focal lens of the two lenses to determine the magnification of the telescope. So we can say that magnification is FO over FE, and as we know the total length of the telescope to be the combined focal length of the lens, we know that as FO plus FE, so we can use these two equations and substitute one into the other to find our particular values. Now, we can also then use uh, this particular equation, and we can use this from our examination books. We don't have to memorize, we only have to be able to use it. Now, again, it doesn't matter what units are used for length as long as they are kept consistent throughout the equation. Now, again, magnification has no units, it's only a ratio showing change. Now, the magnification and angular magnification should be the same value for a telescope. Now, the most effective telescopes have a large magnification. The eyepiece focal length cannot be made too small as it needs to form a magnified image to be observed by the human. So, to have the magnification as large as possible, the focal length of the eyepiece lens needs to be much larger than the eyepiece focal length. So, this means refracting telescopes need to be very, very long in construction. So, this makes refracting telescopes difficult to construct and to sag easily because the supports can't be placed behind the actual um, lenses so as you saw the, the, the uh, lenses can sag very easily so it's expensive to um, house these refracting telescopes now another issue for refracting telescopes is that they suffer from chromatic aberration so chromatic aberration is when an image is blurred due to different colors varying in position as shown in these particular images so this occurs as much visible light emitted from a celestial object is white light which means it consists of light of many different wavelengths or colors now a lens will refract different wavelengths by different amounts the shorter the wave Length, the greater the refraction. So this means blue light is refracted more than red light. This means the focal length of a lens varies with for different wavelengths. So the image of different colors form in different positions as shown in these particular diagrams. So this is an image drawn in an exam to explain why chromatic aberration occurs because you can see where the blue image forms position and when the red image forms position. So you can see that they're found in different places. Now all converging lenses will produce images with chromatic aberration. Now large converging lenses will also be very heavy and can only be supported from the edges, which leads to lenses being easily distorted. And the final issue with refracting telescopes is that impurities and bubbles in the glasses of lenses can absorb and scatter some of the radiation. So this means that refracting telescopes struggle to detect optically faint objects. But let's now look at the other type of optical telescope, the reflecting telescope. So whilst we've looked at refracting telescopes in our previous part of the revision session, we're now going to focus on our reflecting telescope. So a reflecting telescope uses mirrors to reflect and focus light. So most reflecting telescopes have a Cassegrain arrangement. This is a telescope consisting of two mirrors and a lens. There's the parabolic concave mirror, which we call the primary mirror, as it hits, it's the first mirror the radiation hits. We then got our convex mirror, which is called the secondary mirror, as it's the second mirror that the radiation hits. We then got the lens, which is called the eyepiece lens, as it focuses radiation into an observable image. So the three optical devices work together in a reflecting telescope to produce an image. So the concave mirror is shaped inwards, and the, this acts as the principal mirror in the telescope. So the axial rays will hit our concave mirror and they will cause them to, to um, focus at a particular point, the principal focus. But this will only occur if the mirror is perfectly parabolic. Par par parabolic. This is extremely difficult to do, which can cause issues when making reflecting telescopes. So if the mirror was spherical, you will get multiple foci formed after reflection because the focus is produced if the rays cross over. Now only one focus is produced if all the rays intersect at the same point in space. But if the mirror is spherical, you will get Get multiple foci which we call spherical aberration. Now reflecting telescopes suffer from spherical aberration if the primary mirror is not parabolic. Now the Hubble Space Telescope when it first launched had a primary concave
mirrors suffer from spherical aberration, leading to the image you can see on the screen and leading to NASA having to uh, fix the telescope and correct that flaw caused by the spherical nature of that primary concave mirror. Now the secondary convex mirror is placed in front of the focus of the principal mirror, so you can see where the pr principal focus of our objective mirror will be. Now what then happens is we have this arrangement because uh, if there was a detector at this point, such as the human or a sensor, at the point of principal focus it will block out the incoming radiation and stop the image from forming. So this arrangement is called the Cassegrain arrangement and this convex mirror will then reflect the light through the hole into through the concave mirror. Now the concave mirror can have a hole in it because it's in the shadow of the secondary mirror so no instant light can reach that section as the convex mirror is blocking it out. So the image will, for, will be formed into a real image beyond the primary mirror and then the eyepiece lens is then used to magnify the image in the same way as a refracting telescope. So the rays are reflected parallel from the eyepiece lens and these lines form a virtual image at infinity. The primary concave mirror not being perfectly parabolic can lead to images formed with spherical aberration. The secondary mirror and its support can block out some of the incoming light and some of the reflected light will diffract around the secondary mirror which will decrease image clarity. And as well, a large mirror of good quality are cheaper to build than large lenses, and they can also be su uh, supported from underneath as they don't distort as much as lenses do. Now, again, all telescopes can be classified according to two different properties. They can be classified according to their collecting power and their resolving power. Now, both measurable quantities determine the type of images produced by telescopes, and they rely on the diameter of the telescope, whether it be a dish or a mirror or a lens. So the collecting power is the amount of radiation which the telescope receives per second. The greater the area of the dish, the greater the collecting power of the dish. The area of the dish is directly proportional to the collecting power of the telescope. When we can assume that the dish is a circular shape, it means that the diameter squared of the dish is directly proportional to the collecting power of the telescope. So a large collecting power will give a more intense image so the telescope can observe the fainter objects. Telescopes should be built with the largest possible diameter to increase the collecting power to produce the images of the faintest objects in the universe. The resolving power of a telescope is a measure of how much detail can be observed by the telescope. It's the ability to see different objects as separate objects in your image, which we commonly call the resolution. If a telescope has a huge magnification and collecting power, but a low resolving power, you'll just observe blurry images. If two objects have an angular separation greater than the minimum angular separation, they are seen as different objects, but if two objects have an angular separation less than the minimum angular separation, they are seen as one blurry image. So you want your telescope to have a very low minimum angular resolution, so therefore for a high resolve and power. Now, resolution is limited by diffraction. When radiation passes through a circular aperture, a diffraction pattern of bright and dark maxima are then formed. So this pattern is formed by constructive and destructive interference of radiation. So you can see your first minimum here in your first dark ring. So at this point, we've got our first destructive interference. So it's shown as the first dark band around the image. Now we've got our airy disk in the middle, which is our central maxima. Now we can determine the minimum angular separation of a telescope by using a theory called the angular, the Rayleigh criterion which is devised by Lord Rayleigh. So the Rayleigh criterion is the observation that two light sources can be distinguished if the centre of the airy disk from one source is at least as far away as the first minimum of the other source. And you've got to learn the definition of the Rayleigh criteria in terms of the airy disk. So you can see in the top the two objects can be distinguished because their airy disks are not overlapping but on the image at the bottom they will be not be able to be distinguished as two separate objects as their airy disks are overlapping with each other. Now we can also express this idea in mathematics with the equation of theta is approximately equal to lambda over d. Now it's important that theta must be in radians and this equation is given to you in your examination book. Now when asked to define the Rayleigh criterion please give the area disk definition and not the equation. Now the true form of the equation is theta is equal to 1.22 lambda over d but this is not needed for AQA A level physics. Now for optical telescopes d is the diameter of the objective lens or of the objective mirror. The lower the minimum angular separation the greater the detail you can observe. So the lower the minimal angular separation, the greater the resolving power of the telescope. This means a telescope with a large diameter will produce images which are highly resolved. So you should have your telescope to have the smallest minimal angular separation as possible because the small minimal, minimal angular separation will be produced by having a large diameter since you can't affect lambda, the wavelength of the radiation being emitted by the stellar object. Now the second thing you've got to remember is that when you're looking at resolving power, the resolution of your detector can affect the quality of your 
your image. So there's no point having a telescope with a greater resolution than the detector as you'll lose the finer detail when registering the image with the detector. So the quality of the detector can be the large limiting factor on, a resolving, on the resolving power, especially if it is the human eye. So remember, you've got the collecting power and you've got the resolving power, and both quantities rely on the diameter of the dish. Now it's important to know that both quantities want the uh, diameter to be as large as possible, which is why telescopes are built as large as possible. So the last type of telescope we're going to look at is the non-optical telescope. So stellar objects emit all forms of electromagnetic radiation which we can detect because all stars can be considered black body radiators. They emit radiation of all wavelengths. Now in reality, the visible part of the spectrum is a very small proportion. The majority of the electromagnetic spectrum is in fact in the radio section. Now to observe all, all radiation from a stellar object, we've got to use non-optical telescopes. So they're very important to astronomy as the majority of radiation emitted by stars is non-optical. Now each telescope used to detect each type of radiation must be modified to suit the properties of that radiation. Now the most common non-optical telescope is the radio telescope. This is because the largest proportion of the electromagnetic spectrum is radio waves. Now the UK is home to one of the largest radio telescopes in the world with the Lovell telescope at Jodrell Bank. Now the radio telescope is very similar to an optical telescope. It has a primary concave dish similar to the primary concave mirror of the optical telescope. Now ground-based observations are severely affected by the atmosphere for most of the electromagnetic spectrum, but the two regions which are not affected are the visible and the radio wavelengths. Now we can make our primary concave dish in our radio telescope out of wire mesh. This is because the radio wave does not have to be optically reflected, so it doesn't have to be made out of glass. Now it's also important to note that because radio waves have a longer wavelength than visible waves, the dish does not have to be as precise because spherical aberration increases when the wavelength gets smaller. So actually we can use our, me our mesh wire which decreases the weight of the telescope and the cost of the telescope. Now at the focal point an antenna is placed as, as a detector there. Now there's no need for an eyepiece lens to form an image in a radio telescope because it's non-optical. Now radio telescopes also have to be very maneuverable allowing the source of waves to be tracked by the telescope. This is because the sources move across the sky due to the earth rotating not due to the source moving itself. Now the other issue for radio astronomy is man-made interference such as radio telescopes, mobile phones, radar, GPS, satellite TV and microwave ovens. Now it's difficult to remove the interference from orbit and satellites but you can minimize other types of man-made interference by building radio telescopes far away from centers of population. Now radio telescopes can also be used during the day as well as night because there's no interference from visible light. Now using the Rayleigh criteria of theta equals lambda over d because our lambda is much larger our angular minimum separation is much larger so therefore they've got a much poorer resolving power which is an important idea. So for a radio telescope to have the same resolving power as a standard optical telescope, it needs to be a million times bigger. This is because the wavelength of radio waves is a million times bigger than the wavelength of visible light. So a radio telescope would need to be approximately the, same, the size of the UK to produce the same resolving power as a standard optical telescope. The resolving power of a radio telescope is worse than the unaided human eye. So to overcome this issue, we link up lots of radio telescopes together, such as in the very large array found in New Mexico in America. America. We also do this in Europe with our low far air telescope network and we can consider the diameter of the telescope with the distance between the different telescopes and this gives a resolving power thousands of times better than optical telescopes and linking the telescopes together also helps with local interference because they can be removed from individual detectors. Now radio telescopes are much easier to construct than optical telescopes since the construction of a dish from wire mesh is cheaper and easier than glass and the longer the wavelength of radiation being detected the less it's affected by imperfections so radio telescopes never suffer from spherical aberration. Provided the mesh size is smaller than lambda over 20, radio waves are reflected rather than diffracted through the mesh. Now that is going to be a very very large value for when lambda is in the order of kilometers, so therefore the, di the dish will probably avoid spherical aberration. So it can be a very very large value. So you can see our schematic diagram for a radio telescope. The design of a single dish radio telescope is very similar to that of a reflecting optical telescope. The parabolic metal surface reflects the radio waves to an air without any spherical aberration 
and there is no need for a secondary reflector as the area can be placed at the focal point. The information is then transmitted for analysis. It may need a preamplifier first. So let's now look at infrared telescopes. They are very similar to optical reflecting telescopes in that they have a primary concave mirror to focus the radiation onto a detector. The radiation must be a charge couple device as the radiation is non-optical. Now the infrared radiation has a longer wavelength than visible light so it doesn't have to be as parabolic as optical telescopes. But infrared radiation like all objects will emit infrared radiation so this means they will provide interference on their own readings and cause, cause a blur in images. So to minimize the interference infrared radiation telescopes must be cooled to very low temperatures using either liquid helium or refrigerating units. Now in addition infrared radiation is absorbed by water vapor in the atmosphere. This means infrared telescopes should be placed in space to avoid this effect. So you can see on this particular diagram water vapor is absorbed by our atmosphere. Now also you can note that um, it will be very expensive to place it into space so what you could oh, and the other issue is if you place it into space it's going to take a lot more money and a lot more time to correct and maintain. So many space based infrared telescopes cannot extend their missions because they can't have their coolant replenished in space. So you can place your infrared telescopes on a tele on a aeroplane or weather balloon so aeroplanes and weather balloons go above water vapor found in the atmosphere of the earth or you could also place your infrared telescopes on the surface of the earth in a high dry place which is the Mount Kia Observatory in Hawaii or in the Shero Shatakanta telescope in At the Atacama Desert in Chile. Now you can then now look at UV telescopes which again are very similar to optical reflecting telescopes. They use a primary concave mirror to focus the radiation onto a detector. The detector must be a charged couple device as the radiation is non-optical. So again our UV radiation has a shorter wavelength than visible light so the mirror needs to be more parabolic than the optical telescopes which makes our UV telescope very difficult to manufacture. Now UV is also absorbed by the ozone layer in the atmosphere so your UV telescope should be placed into space to avoid this effect. Now as the UV radiation is absorbed high up in the atmosphere then placing the UV telescope on a mountain will be pointless but you could strap it to a high altitude weather balloon or aeroplane to overcome this problem but ideally place it into space but it's very expensive to carry out and very expensive to maintain so you don't tend to get an extension on their mission lifetimes. You've also got to be aware how x-ray telescopes work which are another telescope found in astronomy. Now x-rays do not reflect off a surface like other forms of radiation. They either transmit through the radiation or absorb by the material as are shown in radiographs but x-rays will reflect slightly off a surface if they graze the surface but this only slightly changes the path of the x-ray like skimming a stone off water. So therefore the x-ray telescopes have a series of nested mirrors. Each mirror will, will just uh, hit the x-ray and cause it to graze slightly so it will only slightly change the path. But each grazing gradually alters the direction of the x-ray until it's brought to a focal point. So another name for an x-ray telescope is a grazing telescope. So many uh, x-ray telescopes have 58 nested mirrors which gradually alter the direction of the x-rays. Now the x-ray telescope uses either CCD or a Geiger counter as the detector for images. Now x-ray radiation is absorbed by the atmosphere so we shall place it up into space rather than on a mountain to, ob to get observations. But you could also strap it up to a high altitude weather balloon or aeroplane to overcome this problem. But like I said before, the ideal solution is to put it into orbit, but as mentioned, it's very expensive to carry out and maintain, so it's very important we know how these work. So you can think of our modern telescopes and why they're put into space. Now, all telescopes must be connected to a detector by, to register images collected by the detector. Now, the most common type of detector is a charge coupled device, or CCD, which is a series of silicon chips about the size of a postage stamp. Now, each silicon chip is divided in a million of identical picture elements, or pixels, and the number of pixels on the CCD determines its resolving power. The greater the number of pixels per area, the greater the resolving power. So you can note here our, our each pixel which acts as a potential well. So what happens is a bit that how this, the charge couple device works is a bit with the photoelectric effect. So photons of light are instant to this, the silicon chip. If the photon has more energy than the work function of the silicon, electrons are released. So the amount of charge found on each pixel builds up to form an image on our CCD. The dividers of the pixel traps the charge so it is retained on the charge couple device. The electrodes will then move the electrons in order for the information to be processed so when you want to see your image they'll shuffle all the electrons along to be counted to form your image. Now as some photons do not have more energy than the work function not all incident photons register an image on your CCD but the number of electrons trapped in each well of a CCD is proportional to the number of photons hidden in the pixel so it will form the correct image pattern but the percentage of registered photons compared to the total photons instant to a device is called the quantum efficiency which is the photons registered over the total photons 
photons times by 100. Now the quantum efficiency of a CCD is 80% or higher, whilst the quantum efficiency of an eye is 1%. Now another problem with eyesight is that at low levels you get a loss of colour vision, so that quantum efficiency decreases even more. Now it's important to note that with our particular CCD, the exposure time for the CCD is much larger than that of the eye, so it's easier to observe uh, fainter images. Now if a charge couple device is exposed to too many photons, the charge can spill over the pixels, which leads to an effect called bleeding, and can cause the image to be smeared as shown in the following images. So we can now compare and contrast the two main types of detectors in astronomy. We've got CCD, which has a quantum efficiency of 80%, and the human eye, which has a quantum efficiency of 1%. The CCD detects all parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, but the human eye detects only the visible part of the spectrum. The CCD has a spatial resolution of 10 micrometers, and the human eye a spatial resolution of 100 micrometers. The CCD has a high resolving power, whilst the, the human eye a lower resolving power. A CCD, you can copy, share, and distribute images easily, but the human eye is cheaper and much simpler to use. Now, just to clarify, the spatial resolution is the minimum distance between objects, which allows the objects to be seen as two separate objects by the detector. Now, a CCD has a higher resolution as the objects can be situated closer and still be seen as separate objects. This is due to the number of different pixels found on your CCD. So let's summarize what we've looked at. A converging lens focuses parallel rays to a point called the principal focus. A real image is formed by a converging lens if the object is further away than the principal focus. And a virtual image is formed by a diverging lens if the object is nearer to the lens than the principal focus by a converging lens, where magnification is image height over object height. Though you can have a ray diagram to show the image formation in normal adjustment with angular magnification and normal adjustment being m is equal to theta i over theta o and the focal length of the lens lead to m is equal to f o over f e you can have the cassegrain arrangement using a parabolic concave mirror and a convex secondary mirror and a ray diagram show the paths of rays through the telescopes up to the eyepiece and know the relative merits of reflectors and refractors including the spherical and chromatic aberrations and you should know the similarities and differences of radio telescopes compared to optical telescopes including structure positioning use compared to the comparisons of resolving power and collecting power and comparison of the I and CCD detectors in terms of quantum efficiency, resolution and convenience of use. So I hope you've enjoyed this revision session on telescopes, which is part of the astrophysics option in AQA A-level physics. Thank you very much for listening and have a lovely day.